folks, seeing that it is 1230 on Monday, March 20th, 2023, I will now call the meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Harwich Affordable Housing Trust Fund to order. And uh, as we always do, I'll start with roll call to my right. Larry Ballantyne. Brendan Lowney. Uh, Joe Powers as Town Administrator and Chair. And to my left. Brianna Nickerson, Housing Advocate. And um, I'm going to note for the record, Brianna Powell. <laughs> See, so I it's did good it that you did myself. it instead of me. <laughs> Uh, she joins us as our housing advocate, and um, we have the regrets of um, members Judith Underwood and uh, Larry Brophy. They're not able to join us today. Um, I do also want to put on the record that we are joined this afternoon by um, Board of Selectmen uh, member and Vice Chair Mary Anderson, Housing Committee Chair Art Bowden. Uh, and did I get that right, or Vice Chair? Oh, just member, sorry. Art Bowden, a member of the Housing Committee, and we have our Director of Planning and Community Development, Paul Helke, with us in the audience as well. Um, thank you, folks. So uh, we'll just uh, jump right into it. And Larry, um, starting out with apologies uh, for not noticing the misspelling of your last name, but uh, thanks for joining us from the board. I'll turn it over to you if you have any remarks. Uh, happy to join the board, and uh, as we discussed, we're just anxious to get moving and keep moving. Mm -hmm. Uh, next, we have uh, minutes from our December 12th, 2022 meeting. Um, I know we have a quorum, so Larry, if you voted on it, that's good. But if you also abstained, uh, we still have a majority of the trust present to adopt them. Uh, Brendan, did you want to make any motions? Regarding? Yeah, motion to approve minutes for December 12th, 2022. That's interesting because I pretty much have to approve and then I'm going to, or second and then I'll abstain. Yep. Yeah. So it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion on that? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. And opposed, abstain. and one abstention. Thank you, Larry. Uh, next we have on our agenda, and this is um, new business uh, for this agenda, but it will eventually become standard business, whether we call it old or not remains to be seen. Um, but I'd ask uh, Brianna Powell, our housing advocate, uh, to just uh, bring us up to date on a project that she's working on uh, regarding reaching out to similar trusts on Cape Cod. Brianna? Yep. So I've been meeting with each town on the Cape that currently has an affordable housing trust to see different projects they're currently working on and how they run their trust fund. Um, I'm currently working on a detailed report that I'll send out upon completion. Um, <coughs> I wanted to use this time to mention a few bits of information that I found worth noting when meeting with some of these towns. Um, so when I met with Orleans, I learned that their main approach to solving housing issues is by supporting the funding of public sewage. All of their short-term rental tax revenue is directly funneled into the public sewage project. Um, the, the trust currently has multiple housing development projects in the works. They have Penrose Project, which is at the old Cape Cod 5 Operations Center. Um, it's 75 units total. 65 of them are LIHTC, or Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program and then 10 are funded separately. Um, I've reached out to Marsha, their housing coordinator, to figure out the exact funding sources for those 10, but their workforce, rather than, I don't know what it goes up to. I believe she said 100% AMI, um, but they're funded separately. Um, <clears throat> they also purchased an old, ho old hotel that they're converting into affordable housing, which is also LIHTC funding. Um, they're considering looking into what it would take to increase the income scope from less than 80% AMI to less than 200% AMI with the rise uh, in housing market in the housing market to help close the gap and assist a larger range of income levels. And then the next one I want to talk about is Falmouth. So their trust is run in a very efficient and effective way. They allow developers to fill out a one-stop application for financial assistance for a percentage of their units to be affordable in perpetuity. The trust is essentially paying for developers to create, ensure the creation in, of affordable housing units. Um, their CPA contributions are 13%, which is 3% over the 10% requirement. Um, and that's helped them greatly with having more funding. Uh, Provincetown has two affordable housing trust funds. One was created before legislation passed the Municipal Affording Affordable Housing Trust Fund in 2005. Um, the year-round rental trust assists with creation and preservation for those that fall in the in income category of 80% to 
to 200% AMI. They used CPA funding along with town funds to fund these projects. The town initially gave the trust $1 million to get this started, um, and then an additional half million six months later. The Affordable Housing Trust works with developers in the creation of affordable housing and housing programs. They've successfully implemented a down payment or closing cost program that I requested a copy of to investigate more in depth. Um, and in Provincetown, the CPC puts 60% of CPA funding into the housing bucket. And this is um, substantially more than the 10% requirement. Um, they've always had a lot of public support. <clears throat> there are so many great resources when connecting with other towns. The goal of this report is to see how different affordable housing trust funds operate and to figure out which, if any, of these programs work for Harwich. With the variety of methods that are already being utilized in other towns combined with new innovative ideas, we will be able to accomplish a more sustainable community for all individuals. Excellent. Thank you. Any thank comments? You. Uh, Larry? Uh, thank you, Brian. It's a great report. I. Uh, very much appreciate going going through that. Uh, I did uh, attend a Zoom meeting or go through meeting last uh, last week from a housing fund. They're talking about how to uh, fund housing, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Actually, I unfortunately forget the name of the group right now. But it was it was in the same uh, kind of the same sense that you're proposing that there's uh, as many ways to approach affordable housing as people uh, as there are people in the room. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea can be creative and use, uh, you know, up to, uh, they didn't get up to 200%, but they were talking about funding of various sources up to 110%. Mm -hmm. And uh, use of uh, CPA funds for part of that, mm -hmm. uh, talking about, you know, using the land as a resource to help fund the rest mm -hmm. of it. But the main take home message now, and I'll email you their slides. Sure, yeah. So you can have that. But I think it's the same theme that you're talking about is that uh, there's room for creativity to meet our to meet our needs and that's what we need to uh, uh, need to approach yeah. thank yeah. you larry brendan yeah i mean to that point exactly there's so many different ways to go about it so it'd be great to you know if you could forward that information the next time when you get it all together that'd be great yeah. especially the one in falmouth i'm interested in seeing that yeah yeah, yeah. they seem to have a great mm -hmm. mechanism uh, before i open my comments we've got somebody online um, are you a member of the trust? Larry, is that you? All right, well, if you could at least mute your phone, we are getting uh, some background noise, and um, if we have any discussions you want to be a part of, please let us know, identify yourself, and we'll put you in the mix. Um, Brianna, thank you. That was um, uh, an excellent presentation. Because mm -hmm. um, you and I have talked uh, at length about uh, some of the conversations you've been able to have uh, with your colleagues on Cape Cod. Um, what's your sense as to how much more information you'll need to have before you want to finalize and submit that to us? I think it should be done by the end of next week. No okay, great. Yeah. All right. Yep. Very good. So we'll keep that in mind for our next meeting as well. Sure. Um, any other comments on this topic, Larry? Uh, to follow up on that, so. The, the report you're talking about then is to take the narrative you, and put some more details behind it on, mm -hmm. on how it was actually structured and some of those guide, guideposts. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yep. All right, thank you. Uh, next up under old business is the discussion of uh, the 2022 annual, excuse me, 2022 affordable housing program in, income and rent limits uh, documents from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, I asked Brianna to include this in the agenda, and I think if you uh, trust members can look in our packet, I think it starts on page four. Um, or excuse me, maybe page five. Um, it starts with a headline of 2022 Commonwealth of Massachusetts Affordable Housing Program Income and Rent Limits, and the effective date of this was um, April 18th, 2022, uh, for 2022, and this corresponds to the federal government uh, housing and urban development uh, department's uh, calendar, meaning uh, we know that we heard from DHCD that we don't expect the rates to be updated in April. Uh, we heard that the federal government is delaying them and we think that they'll update that uh, for May. Um, however, this is a document that we're probably going to rely on 
uh, extensively, and this really gets to the heart of the matter about what are the percentages that are out there and what do we have to deal with. And so you can see on the first page we're looking at there, it has five categories where it indicates um, uh, what the categories get to and what programs, if any, they may be applicable to. And then if I remember correctly, um, if you get into the document, you'll see the breakdown um, for the rent, uh, excuse me, income and rent limits for each of the um, community districts. And of course, we're in the Barnstable district. And if you look on page uh, six of our packet, uh, that document starts out with Barnstable County and what the income limits are if you're dealing with uh, folks that are categorized as extremely low. Uh, the other point I want to bear out on this before we open it up for discussion is if you look at um, <coughs> the page that is identified as 60% of uh, area median, and again, this is an income spreadsheet. And so, of course, my device is not playing nice with me. So if you look at that document, the uh, points I'd want to bear out are um, this is the uh, credit level if a program is relying upon low-income housing tax credits, or as you heard Brianna mentioning with other, some of the other towns, uh, that would be a LIHTC project. Um, Larry, I think you're aware that we had a presentation last summer uh, by two developers, one who's uh, local to Harwich, who were interested in the LIHTC program. And so um, this is the relevant documentation that gets to that. So you can see um, they're talking about 60% of area median income, tax credit eligible, uh, and then it breaks down what that is uh, and what that turns into. So for a family of four, that income level would be $65,220. And Again, it gives the range, I think, from one person to uh, up to six people. And so uh, this is in the packet um, for our awareness and potential discussion if the trustees want. But um, we as the trust should be and will be relying upon these income limits when they are uh, put forward by. We usually hear about it uh, by a report of DHCD after they've released the numbers through, uh, through HUD. Um, again, the numbers for this year are delayed by at least a month, they think. So I'll open that up for any comments or questions. I think that the information we didn't have before, and I think it's great to see where the, where the rents come in, right? It's interesting to see the, you know, 6% area median income um, for one person at 45000 What does that mean? So if you scroll down to the next page, you'll see where the rents are coming in, $1,141 for a studio. 1223 you'll start to see what the rents could be for someone at that income i think that's pretty important to finally put all these percentages to who can we help what are the numbers and there was a lot of guessing before and this really helps that out i've seen this before which is great um, <clears throat> i think it's important that we stick with these numbers and one other thing when you look at the first page it breaks down all the percentages 30 50 60 80 then under each one, you'll see what's available to developers. Is it Section 8? Is it LIHTC? Right. Is it what tax credits? So as we present an RFP for any piece of land, let's say we're doing for an example, once we get that out there, we're looking at low to moderate income housing. We don't really have to define percentages. We can, but it's going to be up to the developer to find a program that's going to work best for him. Right. Then they're going to come present and say, hey, we're looking at you know, 10 units at 80, the rest at 60, and maybe some 30% as well. That's a tool for them when they come to us. I don't think we have to really define, you know, throw a dart at this is exactly what we want. But our goal is low to moderate. So I think that's a very simple uh, way to look at it. So anyways, I think it's a great document. And it's great to have the numbers. You can see them. And for the public to see them as well. Yep. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, I probably would come at it again from my limited knowledge, partly based on my, of course, I forgot to bring you a document from our meeting last week, but if you, uh, LIHTC was one of the focuses of that discussion, and I think for this one, this is, this is great, but it also has to be put in some context, because that's one funding source, but 
even LIHTC, the, the percent you can get help on depends on where you're, where you're scoping out. You know, yeah. if you go a higher percent, you may get less help from mm -hmm. that uh, right. fund, right. but you still get help. Right. And so it's, it's a starting point that then we need to be put in our, mm -hmm. our bag of tools to go forward, and then we can search what else is, you know, right. different tax credits, uh, mm -hmm. different funding sources. And so uh, it's a start, but I wouldn't leave it there. Right. Yep. Exactly. No, I think point well taken. Um, again, I'll see if the person who's online is a member of the trust or just... Um, an attendee at a public meeting? Or a member of the human race? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and then I would just offer to the public if there's any comment, we're, I mean, any topic we're going through, if you have any comments, uh, we certainly want to hear from you. If you could just come to the, uh, to the dais there to be recognized. Um, and uh, that would be for the topic we just talked about with Brianna Powell's update, as well as this one. Anybody from the audience? Oh, Bob, please. Well, and Bob you... is getting up. I'll uh, sure. comment because it comes to mind on part of this discussion. Rihanna, you your point of uh, one looking at uh, wastewater as being a, uh, which uh, in the context of various funding sources, you know, the positives, the negatives for, for uh, uh, was approached on Cape Cod was uh, partly uh, people objected any changes. Uh, that's one. And, uh, and regulatory challenges turn out, mm -hmm. in, in this opinion, to be tougher on the Cape than other parts of Massachusetts. And so, uh, there we are. Bob, good afternoon. If you could just state your name for the record, please. Sure, Bob Spencer from Harwich. Uh, and just relative to Brianna, your report, I had occasion to speak with a um, person whose name I can't recall, but she's with the Wellfleet Affordable Housing Trust, okay. mm -hmm. and spoke to me about the work that they did together with the Wellfleet Housing Authority, mm -hmm. and brought in some outside consultation to figure out what the best way to have a cooperative relationship is. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you to contact her. Yep, yeah, that's spoken with her. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Bob. Anybody else from the uh, public on either of these topics? Um, so for me under old business A, then we'll just, we'll have that document readily available. Um, but I think points well taken by all of you about, it's just one of the tools that we have to rely upon um, as we move forward on potential projects for sure. Um, under item B, discussion of trust document and potential amendments. Um, Larry, we put this in there for, for your benefit. Okay. meaning to give you an opportunity to talk to this. Well, as you know from the board of selectmen, we've talked about it, but yeah. we do have that under the topic for you. Well, the reason I mention it is, is that, you know, I'm, I've been involved in outside discussion, but not as involved that I'm trying to get to right now. And, it, and the uh, struggle I have in my own trying to figure things out is the difference between sources of funding and how we spend funding. Mm -hmm. Because there's, uh, you know, one of the major oh. sources of funding Got busted, Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. You taking Jamie's spot, Mary? One <laughs> <laughs> well, of the major sources of funding is CP, CPA funds, mm -hmm. and that has restrictions on its own. Uh, but that may not be what we maybe are. If we talk about how we spend the funds, then possibly our scope should be broader than that. So we'd be sure it was open to accepting funds from, you know, town meeting or from cell tower or whatever that doesn't have mm -hmm. the same restrictions that may have on CP, uh, CPA funds. Right. So the reason I mentioned this, and I wasn't clear on it, uh, if, if that requires a change in the, uh, docu the trust document to make it broader, I think we should, uh, should have that discussion. And I'm, I, I think we might, well, I'll throw it out there. That's the reason I brought it up, because to be sure we can, uh, we're not tying our hands on trying to dictate the outcome of what, what we're trying to get at on the source of funding that we mm -hmm. that we be sure we have an open discussion. And I'll leave it there for discussion. Sure. Brendan? So from my understanding, <coughs> C, uh, CPC funding, when it comes to us, it can be used up to 80% AMI. But then to get on the, the housing inventory list that we're so desperate yeah. to be 10% under, it's 80% or less. 
So that's something we worked on probably for the last year, and I don't think that has changed much. And then whether we use the cell, to cell uh, tower funding mm -hmm. or any donated money, we still have to follow the rules of, um, of DHCD on how we do everything. And it's low to moderate housing as defined by them, which is 80% or less. Yeah, so no matter where the money comes from, but that's why that document that you put together shows who are we talking about? The AMI, what's 80% mean percent-wise? When you start seeing the rents come in, you could start to see that, oh, there's a lot of people that can be helped. Yeah. Before, everyone was thinking it was just, it's impossible to do 30% or 60%. We can go up to 80% in this. I think we can definitely use the money yeah. in different ways. What? Uh, yeah. Thank you for that. So it may not be necessary. The, the point I need to clarify myself is uh, one of the discussions I was in recently uh, muddy the water a little bit on even the CPA funds is that that could be a portion of the funding but not the whole part. In other words, you could, uh, you could, uh, it's been used in I think some other towns of, of uh, sort of a public partner, public private partnership where we use the, the town the land is used as a base to help pay the expense and it's gone out and then they've gone to CPA funds because it, it meets the goals you're talking about but may not be the entire project you're talking about. In other words, mm -hmm. the, you know, wherever the percent is. And, I, and so I just, I'm just trying to understand that because there may be some legal room. On how well, to go. I just want, my whole point was just be sure that that's possible within the existing documentation. Yeah, and maybe the Board of Selectmen could put a charge to the Housing Committee to maybe find some of that housing you're talking about that exceeds 80%, but under 100, that can be, I'm not saying I want to compete with them with CPC funding, but maybe there is a percentage that can go if they have a good program that yeah. works, whether it's rental assistance or a buy-down program, whatever, that's above the 80. Right. But we're really 80% or less. And I think there's plenty we can do. Um, but to your point, it would be nice to, you know, housing anywhere is important. Exactly. Yeah. I, reason I, well, I'll repeat myself. I want to just be sure we're, uh, we're open to uh, mm -hmm. what's possible. Because yeah, I'm, getting different, I'm getting different information that's not quite yeah. as black and white as that. Mm -hmm. Understood. Thank you. Any other comments on um, O Business B and uh, the trust document? Any other potential amendments? Uh, I don't. I think uh, I think I mentioned this to you, Joe. That uh, Don was Don Howell mentioned to me, uh, Selectman Howell mentioned to me a couple of times that he thought there should be some minor, I call them grammatical changes in the document. That there's confusion between the use of the term. When we confer to the board, is that our committee? This is this board versus the board of selectmen, and I actually didn't uh, quite catch that when I read it. But I'll, it, and I wouldn't uh, do that on its own. This would be something else. But uh, Brendan, I briefly addressed that at that board of selectmen meeting. I read through it. It does define, you know, what is the trust and what is the board, yeah. and maybe it's worth reading over one more time, all of us, to make sure it is correct. Um, it's not on top of my list. Today. Yeah, I, I don't think it's on top of our list to be changing any of the any of the trust documents. But I believe it is it is clear, Joe. Isn't am I correct on that? Well, uh, that? To, to me, it's a it's an opinion. Yeah, and I am of the opinion that it's clear. Yeah, it's clear um, to me. So, but I, but I do have some further comments. But I, I'll hold off until you've okay. completed your thoughts. Brandon. Yeah, no, that's that's all I had. Um, uh, thank you. Now to to that topic, but also generally, and I think if you're looking at the trust document. Um, you know, you can see the first three articles talk about, or the first two articles talk about the trust. Uh, article three talks about the tenure of trustees. And in that line it says, there shall be a board of trustees. So Brianna and I have been working on this and I snuck something into the agenda, I'm so clever. Um, but if you look at the headline of our meeting, it says a meeting of the board of trustees. And so I know we in the town have been using the shorthand to say the affordable housing trust or the trust fund. And for me, when we have our meetings, I think I, I will strive to make it clear that we are the board of trustees that oversee the fund itself. Um, and not the fund as a funding source to be even less clear because I'll talk about that under cell tower. Um, but I think if we start referring to ourselves as the board of trustees, I'm hopeful that any confusion that's out there in the public might um, clear up somewhat. Because for me, um, I didn't see that, that confusion in the document itself. I think if you match up the references, 
the document, I think, indicates when it's talking about the Board of Selectmen, but uh, to me, a simple change would be we can talk about Selectmen uh, or Select Board after May versus trustees, and that might go a long way towards eliminating the confusion, but also go a long way towards cementing what the actual role is of the group that meets regularly in these meetings. Um, because that will tie to the next discussion, which is about cell tower revenue, uh, as well as other sources of revenue. Um, any other thoughts on the trust document and potential amendments or the language contained therein? I just have something quickly. So when I was meeting with Michelle in Provincetown, she did say that CPA funding, there was a change um, to the guidelines where CPA funding can go up to 100%, and if they have separate, they, they keep track of them separately, they were able to use up to 100% for some projects that they trusted. That's not what we have to do here. I'm just saying there was a change where it is possible. Great, but those monies over 80% shouldn't be coming to us. So anything that can be used for 80 plus mm -hmm. funds should be going somewhere else. We wouldn't be able to receive right, those to because- partner with whoever had those. Yes, you could partner yeah. with, but yeah. yeah. And back to the trust document real quick. I mean, I guess, it, I'm not saying it's confusing, but the affordable in Article 1, of Harwich Affordable Housing Trust Fund is called the trust, and then the Board of Trustees is called the board. So, I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'll give it, maybe I'll look it over one more time. Maybe that was the confusion, but it's, sure. you know. Well, we, have, we are trustees. Correct. But on yeah. our website, yeah. we're called members. So maybe we can change that. Well, and that, that was, yeah. my, that was yeah. my point, and this is the yeah, effort today, yeah. is, you know, um, not to the level of rebranding that Kara was able to mm -hmm. do, uh, at 204 system, but we should uh, correct our documents and what we put out there because you're right, we are trustees and not just members. Correct. Uh, and again, that goes to our fiduciary responsibility, which, which unless there are other comments, I'll use as my segue to get to uh, I, funds. I just have one addition. Sure, one. go ahead. Brianna brings up a good point, which I've, I've learned. If it's, I'm never sure why I learned it's correct or not, but what I think I learned is, is that uh, the state provides some leeway in how each town defines or uses CPA funding. And so ours may say 80%, but the state doesn't tie you to that. They, that's a local initiative, and so there's some, there's some leeway to that as well. That's good to know. And that you had said that the individual you spoke with said there was a change. Uh, Michelle and Connor. And you said something about accounting, if I heard correctly, or accounting for the funds. Yeah, if they're... If they're tracked separately. Yeah, so that's what, that's what I wanted to get to uh, as part of our discussion under the cell tower revenue. Um, so I just want to make a note on that one on the tracked uh, mm -hmm. separately. So right now in our fund accounting software, we do show uh, revenue that is associated with the trust fund. There's a separate uh, account and reporting mechanism for cell tower revenue. Um, and it first starts as, it's identified as a Board of Selectmen fund, which we know it is. Uh, in my understanding, there was a mechanism or a process by which trustees would have requested the release of those funds. And I think what we may wanna do, uh, because I think there's a third thing that's out there as well, and that's how we, uh, for our fund accounting, how we track our CPA funds. Presently, the, uh, the trust fund and the trustees have been operating on amassing all of those sources into one um, account, and when we do that, we lose that tracking ability. And so that came into play when we were talking about the Marceline purchase, you know, where CPC wanted to know how much of the CPC funds went to that, and the reality was it was a big bucket of money that included that South Tower revenue and some other smaller amounts. But going forward, and I preface all of this uh, knowing that you all know that we have a need for a finance director town accountant. Um, so in the meantime, I'm working with our auditors and division of local services generally. But I think we can rely upon the current accounting method to, uh, sorry, I just want to make sorry, yeah, yeah. Yep, that's right, um, to make sure um, we can track it separately so we don't have those artificial restrictions because of the way we handled it. Um, and further, um, specifically to the topic of cell tower revenue. Uh, I went into Munis this morning and there's about $71,000 in change in fiscal year 23. So that is presently the amount that I think could be authorized by the Board of Selectmen 
Um, and what I would recommend is not that it be transferred, but it be available for use by the trustees. Um, but there are several years worth of funds remaining uh, to the tune of uh, almost uh, um, $380,000. So I have a call in to our auditors anyway, but I'd be curious to see um, if the town has not been accounting for all of the funds uh, at the time of request. So there could be more funds available. And again, for me, those funds could go more towards administrative costs, meaning if we're going to do an RFP or we need a consultant or something else, there's no restriction on those funds. That's just for the use of the trustees. Um, that could go a long way towards really segregating what we get from CPC and other groups is meant to impact upon affordable housing. Cell tower revenue could be used administratively for the trustees to accomplish the same thing. Mm -hmm. So um, so the point I wanted to bear out on this is um, I'm not familiar with the process other than I believe it was a vote two years ago that the Board of Selectmen reacted to a request of the trust. So I'm going to further refine that with uh, the auditors and um, certainly have something come before the Board of Selectmen, hopefully before town meeting. Yeah, so no, that's good because I don't think we've paid a lot of attention to yep. that trust fund from the selectmen side, mm -hmm. you know, except when it's come up as the uh, the child center there, right? To be to be sure that's funded because one year we got crossways on that and had to appropriate some special funds to be sure it was it stayed in place. Yep. But that's a good point, Joel, because we probably need to bring that up and have some more discussion on yep. on that. Thank you, Brendan. Any thoughts? Okay. Anybody else? Any thoughts? Anybody online? All right. Uh, next, we have on the agenda discussion of engineering study on the property adjacent to Pleasant Lake Avenue. And I asked uh, Brianna to get some materials together. Thank you. That's so there you go. And um, Brendan, you might have seen this before, but. Um, this is a, a document, and we have, um, do we have a couple copies for the audience, or? Here's another one. Oh, yep. Let's just put those out on the table. Uh, it's called the Housing Toolbox for Massachusetts Communities, and I believe it was put out by uh, Mass Housing Partnership. Um, but when Brianna and I uh, had an opportunity to meet with Larry to, uh, to bring him up to speed on the trust, uh, you know, we talked about what next steps, what would be the appropriate next steps to take um, regarding um, the Marceline property that we own. Now, I'll, I will use this topic to generally say that um, Katie Klein from KP Law is, is moving on the uh, tax title research for the, um, the missing tooth parcel, as I call it. And so we're moving forward on the eminent domain taking on that other parcel. Um, she agreed that there was nothing in that process that should hold up anything we're doing regarding Marceline, um, it is understood that the town is going to do the taking. So we can just announce that that parcel is going to be part of the overall inventory. Um, but as you can see in the Massachusetts toolbox, these are recommendations on um, what responsible parties should do in preparation for a request for proposal. Uh, and certainly for the development of land. So you can see that the first, um, you know, you have engineering tasks, then responsible party and project phase. So site survey is the responsibility of the municipality because we're the owners of the land. And this would be uh, prior to development. And so you can see a comprehensive inspection of the property, including trees, other vegetation, unusual or natural soil or ground conditions, underground pipe, soil, and land discoloration. Uh, historical assessment of property going back 100 years. So that is the element, for the most part, that KP Law is undertaking. Um, as a quick aside, they, um, they sub out their tax title work uh, to a firm in Braintree called Marsh Moriarty. So they're already aware of this process. Um, and then, you know, questions that we'd want to rely upon our internal agencies, such as uh, our Director of Planning and Community Development regarding uh, floodplain boundaries, I know in this particular area, I believe it encroaches upon but is not within uh, the Six Ponds District of Critical Planning Concern. 
Um, but in any event, in talking uh, with Larry, and I'll shut up for a moment, Larry, so you can talk, but the thought is that Fine. you know we may want to just do one last quick review through engineering mm -hmm. um, to, to just re rely upon that, because then the next phase would be uh, developers would be responsible for certain pre-development activities, uh, and then the town would have some final things to do. So, Larry, I'll start with you on that. Okay, uh, thank you, Joe. The, uh, uh, Brandon, as you know, we've, in our discussion with the selectmen, we've been anxious to get an RFP out. Well, you can answer that. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, when, I, when I look at what's going on, uh, we've, we've done a site survey, but it's been only the, to uh, in checking the title, basically. And uh, I think with other, uh, the next step, as Joe pointed out, would be to uh, do an in-depth site survey showing what is possible there, what, what lands are, you know, the ver vernal pools are the areas we can't build on, what would be, would be the maximum uh, utilization we could do with the property. Because my, my own, uh, not speaking for the board, of course, but my own fear is, is that, uh, or let me say it differently, I'm never sure how much a, uh, just a, a general uh, discussion moves this project forward. It's much, I'm much more in favor of having a, having discussions where we have something to show people to react to. And in that, and in that sense, uh, I think it'd be short money, to use an improper term probably, but uh, some expenses to go ahead and do the more in-depth site survey to get the project so we have, in my mind, the intermediate step between discussions and going out with an RFP that will give us more definition to get uh, for discussion, because it's, we're all anxious to move uh, ahead on this as fast as we can. On the other hand, we can't move without public, a good public discourse. And I think this type of site, these guy, intense or, or more in-depth uh, site survey would move us in that direction, or at least give a discussion of what's possible, what's not possible off the top, and then we could use that basis for discussion and move that into the uh, RFP. Thank you. Brendan, any thoughts? I mean, it's, it's really based on cost. It's a big piece of land. Um, originally, when we were buying the property, I did have a, a geoengineer take a look at everything, and he went through the FEMA maps and the GIS maps, and um, I could forward that information to you. It's all the documentation that he did. Um, but just to take a look at the property, to make sure there's no wetlands, mm -hmm. where the water table was, and everything else. So, you know, at first glance, you know, going through all the maps, he thought there was no major concerns with the property. So that was one of the things we did that um, I just had access to him to, to do it. Um, so I'll forward that email to you and you can send it out to all of us and see it again, right? Uh, when was so that? some work has been done. Was that oh. spring of 21 probably? That was been spring of 21, yeah. so April 2nd when yeah. I got it back. Yep. Yeah. And that's excellent, we can build on yeah. that and do some work. I don't know if we want to spend 50, 60 grand. I mean, I, I recently seen, seen an RFP um, in the vineyard. The VA is doing a project, and it was pretty much, hey, we have a big piece of land. Come one, come all. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll read through that again, and maybe forward yeah. that as well, so you could see what they came up with, which is a piece of land that's sitting next to a dump, has no road access, not landlocked, but, <clears throat> and um, they're moving forward with that project. So it's up to the developer sometimes to do due diligence. I don't know if we want to race to spend 50, 60 grand for a site survey, unless we have to. I mean, we have a piece of land, we should know it's there. I, I agree with that. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're, unfortunately, we're in agreement. I don't want to spend a fortune, but I think some, some money to move ahead. Right. I just see it's a, an important inter intermediate step. And maybe the baseline we have makes that less expensive to do, right. too. Yeah. Right. We'll build on what we have and mm -hmm. bring it in within a reasonable okay. uh, fee structure. Well, I think we can certainly make available um, engineering work that was done by, yeah. or engineering study that was done um, by Tom uh, Stello, was he engineer? He just did the survey. Oh, survey, sorry. He just did the survey. But, but put together all of the materials we have, mm -hmm. provide that to the engineering firm and say, we're looking for a once over, and if there's anything else you think we should do before we go to that, because um, this is my favorite one, phase um, half one E, which puts it on the developer, and I think that's what you were getting to, Brendan, that yeah. you know, if we have a sense of what we have available and can articulate the same, then we say to the marketplace, 
here you go, here's what we know, you should find out whatever you need to find out, and we'd be interested in your responses. Yeah, and the VA, as the developers came back, their answer to the RFP was, here's a piece of land, he, and they did all the septic, where the buildings are going to sit, yep. and some you know early renderings, um, just to win, win the project, yep. they're in the process of doing that. Yep. So Very good. Uh, anybody else on that topic? It's, um, it's a biggie. Yes, well, please. Mary's up. Who, ca who comes up with page one and a half? I'll go. Mary Anderson, uh, I, I really just want to move forward on this, and if uh, what Brendan says is we already have that, can we skip that? And how long is KP Law need for their list? So the tax title process, I think, generally speaking, takes, what did she say, four to six weeks? Um, so the conclusion of that would be um, they would then tell us to put uh, an amount that we got at town meeting into escrow, and they'll, they'll initiate uh, the taking itself. And okay. so that's why that can go concurrent. Um, for me, the engineering that we're talking about is really – for me to give comfort to the general public and any developers that we have cobbled together all of the work that's been done over the last two years. We've engaged an engineering firm to review it and say that everything's good and go forward. Okay. So to me, I do see this being, speaking in procurement terms, something under 50,000, but also possibly something under 10,000, where we're asking them okay. to just see what we have available and if they think there's anything missing, recognizing that we're gonna put the rest of it on uh, developers that are responding. And do you think we'd be ready for an RFP in like maybe two months? So um, working with council, the RFP process, and that would be the next topic for the next meeting, yeah. uh, is something we can do immediately. Okay, because great. any of these things that we have going on, we make reference in the RFP that, you know, be advised that the town, as of this writing, is, you know, working with engineering or that the town, as of this writing, is working with council to... Um, grab the other parcel that's not the word we'd use but i think you get the meaning so that we just put notice out there that this is what's happening great um and if i could to that point i think that's the biggest conversation is what what are we going to ask the developing world uh, development world construction world to respond to and so that's what we talked about before but now we have our latest member you know for me the things would be are we offering up the land as it's as it sits for a certain dollar value, um, um, multi-year lease, whatever the case may be. But so for me, that's always been the area of concern, Mary, is what is the RFP and how do we want to get it out there? Because I've been concerned with our um, community engagement discussions that folks have sort of been all over the map, if you will, as part of the expression of, well, we're going to be able to do this, we're going to be able to do that. And the reality is the town was never in a position to do that. So when we say we, I think we we're referring to developers. So, Paul? Thank you. Um, so typically when um, any real estate is, is purchased, if there's a mortgage on it, the, um, the lender will require uh, that a, a 21E or slash phase one environmental assessment be undertaken. Uh, Paul, I'm going to interrupt. Thank you for clarifying. So the toolbox says... Phase one slash 21E. Thank you. I was trying to gently. Um, <laughs> no, so I'm going to own that, and I'll never do that again, but thank you. So, so they're synonymous. It's a, it's, it's a yep. phase one environmental assessment. And before a community buys property, that's usually one of the things that's done to protect the taxpayers to make sure that we're not buying any land that's contaminated that we'd be responsible for cleanup. Um, so these, these studies are done by a licensed site professional. And uh, there's, there's a phase one, which is uh, uh, a study that does not go into uh, great detail, but it, it inventories the history of the property to determine whether or not it's had a history of use as an industrial type use that might have involved some hazardous materials. They'll do a, um, a reconnaissance of the ground to see if there are any hints that there was ever any uh, contamination um, on the property or being used as part of a process um, of a historical use of the property. Um, they'll do uh, some limited uh, 
um, soil investigations. If they if they see something that's a yellow flag, then they'll, they'll they might dig and take soil samples and test them, or they may um, dig deeper and take uh, groundwater samples and test the groundwater. So this is something that I think. Um, it, since it, it, it wasn't done before the land was purchased, it would be a real good idea for us to uh, go ahead and engage a licensed site professional to undertake that work before we offer it for sale. Otherwise, the, some of, w without that, there may be some um, developers or bidders that will be gun shy because it doesn't have, you know, you're working on the clear title, then the other thing that we need to provide is a clean um, bill of health for the, the land itself, that there's no contamination. This, this could, um, it, we could get uh, proposals that have um, terms that require that we give them time to do this kind of investigation and that they could bail out if they found something. So I think the town's in a better position if we were able to um, hire an environmental engineer, a licensed site professional, to do um, the phase one study. That could potentially lead to requiring additional um, analysis of the, of the soil or the groundwater if they uncover something that, that leads them to believe that there could be a problem. For example, um, you know, we find some empty 50-gallon drums. That's a, a yellow flag that better find out what's going on around that. So I think this is something that we should do, and if we don't do it now, um, some developers might not bid on it, some other developers might, might balk at it, and it's likely that we would anticipate um, a term of um, uh, when it would go under agreement, purchase and sales agreement, developer would have a term that says, we need to have access to the site, we need to do this investigation, and if it uncovers something that's not favorable, they'll bail out. Well, I'd like to start first, if I could. I think my colleagues are gonna have questions. Uh, first of all, thank you. So knowing that we're relying upon uh, Mass Housing Partnerships Housing Toolbox, and their recommended best practice is for the municipality to do the site survey, but for the developer to do the phase one of the 21E, what sort of, to the earlier questions, what sort of cost would the town be looking at, or the trustees really, be looking at for that kind of uh, program? And I think for me, more importantly, what sort of liability? Um, I would have, I was imagining, and I'll say this recognizing I'm on uh, recorded devices and all that, the town might have enjoyed some plausible deniability uh, where we purchased the land from a private entity without that level of detail. Um, if we now take on that obligation and we, the town, discover something that looks negatively on the purchase, are we then stuck with unbuildable land? So the, uh, if, there, if some contamination was discovered, uh, it could be most likely, it, it, it could be cleaned up by a licensed site professional overseeing the removal of contaminated soil or contaminated groundwater. Um, I'm, I don't know how much one of these phase one environmental assessments cost. I'm going to throw up a, a wild guess of 20,000, 25,000, something like that. But you still maintain that the town should do this rather than us putting it on the developer? I think it's a good idea because um, one way or the other, somebody's going to do it and if they find, if, they, if a, a bidder or developer finds it, um, they could just walk away from it. Uh, so that's it's something to consider. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Paul, Larry? Uh, no, thank you for that, Paul. Uh, I'd just be repeating myself. I, I think this is the next step to move forward in, yeah. in, the, in yeah. an increase of public discussion because I'm with Mary and I want to move ahead, but I want to be careful that we're having opportunities for public discussion yeah. on, some, on something they can look at. You know, what are the, well, enough said. Uh, Brendan? Uh, last comment about timing. I mean, an RFP, the ones I've been seeing recently, um, <clears throat> they could be 50 to 60 pages long. So I don't think it's something that's going to happen in, in two weeks yep. unless we focused 100% right. of our time on that. Yeah. But I think starting the process will, you know, one step forward, right? So, but just keep that in mind. You're talking a pretty comprehensive RFP that you're yeah. putting out on 13 acres of land. Yep. Thank, so. thank you for that. And I will also say that um, given that our Director of Planning and Community Development has given us a value 
um, that it's under 50,000. So we can uh, put out a request for a th three quotes at least for the um, for the site survey or the phase one 21E environmental survey. Um, so at least that could be expedited. Okay. Yeah. Bob, sure. I just want to make sure that I understand if the town takes on this burden and responsibility and finds something, the town is on the hook to clean it up. Is that right? I, I would respond uh, generally that yes. Um, I do think once we receive that report, we've worked with all of our reg uh, regulatory agencies and anyone else that could come to, to bear on this mm -hmm. to see what was in the land uh, that causes that liability. It could be something fairly innocuous. We might be able to write through council something that says we're uh, <coughs> divulging this uh, finding, mm -hmm. but it is you know not insurmountable. But the bigger the finding, uh, the bigger the impact on the town would be my take. But the alternative would be to have the developer do the environmental, and if they found something, as Paul just said, they could just walk away. It's very similar to a home inspection when you're purchasing a house. So, you know. Understood. Yeah, it'd be very simple. Yeah. But isn't the responsible thing to have somebody do the, the inspection that's going to be responsible to clean it up? Um, well, I'll open it up, but I'm going to say yes. But I think all, all fingers point to the town. Uh, I think yeah. where the town purchased this land mm -hmm. and did not um, conduct the same due diligence, we bought it, we own it, we're responsible. Okay. Um, but others are looking to talk, so I'll yeah. share the mic. But it's a great question, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the um, Department of Environmental Protection oversees these types of issues. and. Um, they would, if there was some contamination, they would determine who the responsible party is. That may or may not be the current owner. Mm -hmm. So if, if uh, this site was used for some type of um, heavy uh, industrial commercial use and there, there was some type of contamination and that company is still in existence, um, the DEP might determine that they are the responsible party. So this is, actually, this is a legal question and a legal discussion, and we don't have lawyers in the room, so I'll caution that we shouldn't draw conclusions about who may or may not be a responsible party in the event that there were some kind of contamination discovered. I appreciate that. I think where we're coming from is uh, the town acquired uh, ancient land where we're not aware of any of our records that there was any industry on it. And so my concern then would be if it's a situation of illegal dumping um, in any event. Art? Uh, good afternoon, Art Bowden. Uh, I fully agree with uh, Paul's, <coughs> pardon me, I'm getting over a cold here. Paul's assessment, uh, I think, is spot on. And uh, I, I think uh, going forward with the, the study and seeing what, the, what liabilities the land may or may not possess, and I, I think it's the right thing to do, and I think it's the only thing to do. Because if you leave it on a developer, like it was said, you could either bail. Someone, if there's some deficiency with the property, someone's going to pay for it. It's not going to get done for nothing. And if you put out an RFP, and then it, that could throw everything, you know, off the table and start all over again. And now you, so the best way is be up front, do the study. You know what, what it is there. And that also puts you in a, a better uh, a negotiating position because now you're going to have developers come in and say, listen, we got a virgin piece of property here. The only thing that was on there was some cows and, and that was it. It was used for pasture and there's, there's no contaminants, there's no this, there's no that and whatever. And I think you're going to attract better quality and more people to want to develop there. That's all, that's out of the way. At the uh, risk of uh, trying to move this along faster. It doesn't say here, but I, I know you probably can't vote on this today because it doesn't say in the agenda that you might vote on this article. But if you could, I think you should vote to go ahead and initiate, initiate an RFP to, to do the engineering work and, and get that over with. So if I could, there's no vote uh, required on that. 
Oh, so um, what we're looking for is a sense of the trustees. Okay. Procurement still rests with administration. So we know that we have the funding source yeah. and it's under the, the threshold for RFP. So okay. we, can, we can go ahead as an administrative act. Good. So you, you're yep. standing on a threshold and we need, you need a little nudge. Yep. Please do it. Thank you. You turn around and say, okay, we're doing something, folks. Understood. That's what yep. everyone wants to see. Thank you, Wim. Thanks, Art. Uh, anybody else to this topic? Marvin? So, Marvin, we're just asking that you uh, formally identify yourself for the record. Uh, Marvin Parker, Harwich. Um, I'm kind of playing off of what's been said here, but so let's assume that there was contamination and the town did not pay for it. It was put onto the developer to do. Couldn't the cost of that be deducted from the sale price of the property? Is that not an option instead of the town having to pay for it? So uh, my, my answer might be potentially, but that's in the, um, the devil in the details of the RFP language. So we'd rely for a council on that kind of guidance. Mm -hmm. um, in, a, in other words, if that's an option, we would certainly look for them to write that passage in the RFP. Uh, right. Typically, most of the RFPs we do are written by staff. So, yeah. mm -hmm. um, so that's a great question for council and for future consideration. Well, I was thinking, based Brendan, Brendan, yeah. yeah, had said it's similar to a home inspection. Well, okay, if you get a home inspection, mm -hmm. you're getting, you know, you can deduct some money from the purchase price. So that's that's where I was going. With well, in some cases, it could be a purchase or it could be a lease of the property. Mm -hmm. So that's where the devil's in the details. Joe's talking about. We have to look into that. Right. So okay. I, I think maybe getting some proposals on what it would cost to do that, and then we can take a vote and see if we want to spend that kind of money. But mm -hmm. not knowing exactly what the money is and everything else, it's a great idea. I, I agree with it, but I'm not just a huge fan of spending money if we don't have to. Right. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marvin. Uh, anyone else that wants to be heard on uh, old business item uh, D? Uh, item E is a discussion of the disposition of 70 Willow Street. And the, uh, really Bill, the, let me interrupt you. Sure, go ahead, Larry. Are you taking this as consensus to move forward? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think I heard uh, generally that we can at least okay, solicit that for, for the, quotes for and record. all that. Yep, yeah. okay. definitely. Thank you, Bill. Um, item E, it's uh, the discussion is really an update. Uh, Brianna and I met uh, virtually with council. Uh, the question related to 70 Willow Street, and Larry, I'm sure you recall, uh, the board took an action in 2021 to reshape the boundaries, which we understood was the last outstanding item. Um, however, council um, does not agree. They do recommend, as our former planner had suggested, um, that we do a uh, more in-depth tax titles um, search. And so Marsh Moriarty is already on that as well. Um, the property is still under the purview of the Board of Selectmen. Um, the charge of the town meeting article was that the board dispose of it for affordable housing purposes. And to me, that's relevant because whatever ends up happening with 70 Willow Street, it may not bear the same restrictions that the trust has uh, as far as what's affordable and all that. So bottom line on 70 Willow is we are doing the deeper dive on tax title because attorneys have indicated that it was nowhere near as clean as we thought. Mm -hmm. And so that's presently underway. This has been a lifetime project. I think it would be nice to uh, end it at some point. Sure. My comment to council was, well, we have documents going back 25 years that seem to suggest we're good and um, we rely upon council to protect us from liability and they thought the prudent step was that tax title search. Brendan, any thoughts? No. Nope. Art? <laughs> Art Bowden again. Willow that. Street. Willow Street again. <laughs> we, were <develop> <laughs> we were talking about Willow Street back in the horse and buggy days, and the same issues came up, and we thought it was resolved. I, I went after in the uh, town meeting of 21, whatever magic year it was, I thought it was resolved and it was settled, and now, you, now I find out it's not resolved. Correct. It's like... How can we make this piece of property go away? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> if, ha, ha, I, I even flagged it for habitat. I'll be, uh, and they gave me a hat for it. But anyways, no. uh, um, and I think they took a look at it because when they were developing Murray Lane, it, it's almost a two back. I don't know if they exactly back up. And uh, the only thing that habitat said, uh, they were interested in it. But because of the, the Donnybrook that uh, developed with uh, Murray Lane, uh, Habitat was still a little gun-shy because sure. they wanted that, the dust to settle. Well, the dust has settled over there. The homes are 
completed, occupied, and everyone's gone back to where they are. So um, how much longer is this going to take? <laughs> so again, tax title research, according to our vendor, is four to six weeks. Um, it's already underway. Um, for me, I'll, I'll answer the rhetorical question earlier of what's it going to take to get rid of this land and just put out there that um, this is why I preach about stability. And so if we have the same people uh, <laughs> internally uh, and certain key functions so that we're not missing the institutional knowledge because when this question was first raised to me, I knew nothing about 70 Willow Street. Oh. Um, the information that I was getting anecdotally was incorrect. So doing a deeper dive, finding the actual votes of the board and town meeting, um, that's where we uncovered there was a lot of assumptions, but the reality was far different from the assumptions. Okay. And so that's one of the things I strive to clear up going forward on everything we do. We are striving to now do things right the first time so that we don't have these 20 plus year uh, lingering uh, issues that are out there. I'm going to mark my calendar and I'll be back. To <laughs> <laughs> back when? I didn't hear well, the date. I'll, I'll give you two months because uh, things, you know, that's, I think thank that's you very fair, much. Art. Thank you. But Joe, just to be clear, we've never had possession of that. That's always been with Correct. the Board of Select. Correct, exactly. Yep. Yep. Point well taken. Thank but I, you. I believe, like, the encroachment of the building that was in the upper right hand corner or the north um, northeast corner was resolved. I believe through the boundary. Yeah, so that, that the, the boundary, boundary thing's been, that's been resolved. Correct. Okay. Yep. Right. Yep. So now it's just a title issue. Exactly. Right. Yep. Uh, anybody mm -hmm. else for this topic? Brendan makes a good point because our discussion was the boundary issue on the board the last time. Correct. Yeah. We yep. assumed the title was correct. Right. Yeah. And so that, that brings into uh, my mind what happens if, if we get a difference of opinion this time? Do we get to choose the opinion we like? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let that question lie as it was presented. Um, yeah. Well, to Art, Art's point, there's been progress. <laughs> and, and, and generally speaking, one of the things that we've talked about internally as a staff is um, we got some advice from a former member um, of the planning board that was um, well-schooled in the, in the role of eminent domain land takings uh, for a state agency. And so he left behind a blueprint that we as a team are going to use going forward. And the first thing is, is you search for title. And then if there's questions that come from that, you do surveying to say we think these are the boundaries and then you do any environmental and then. So we're going to in, incorporate that best practice as an actual practice. And hopefully that corrects a lot of the situations that we've been dealing with. Um, before we adjourn, I will tell you that some of the topics I'd look to have coming back at our next meeting, and we'll determine the date on that. Um, Brianna and I, along with uh, Mary Anderson um, and uh, Brendan from uh, the trust here, were guests at the Housing Committee meeting last uh, week. Uh, some great things came out of that discussion, but also Brianna will have an update uh, because I've directed her to reach out. Um, I like to reference my favorite management documentary, The Godfather, and reach out to the other five families of housing. And so there's going to be outreach to uh, Rios Housing Committee, Housing Authority, uh, Community Preservation, and Finance Committee uh, to see if there could be a representative from those groups to have regular conversations with Brianna, uh, and that is how we can have staff relying upon subject matter experts without relying upon public meetings. And then the updates from those will come through the uh, trustees' meetings here. Um, so with that, we were um, at least on a monthly schedule. Um, I'm trying to do Mondays in my mind. I would think maybe April 3rd might work. Mm -hmm. uh, two weeks from now gives us more time to get some more material. Yep. So we'll say uh, Monday, April 3rd at 1 p.m. here in the Griffin Room. All right, without objection. So then, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Uh, Brandon. Oh, second. Yeah, we can't leave till you second. <laughs> Thank Sorry. you. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. Important at this meeting. <laughs> aye, zero. All right, we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody.